Hi. In this presentation, we're going to talk about the Constitution law and structural inequality. When I talk about structure, I want you to think about social relations, particularly among groups, and the identities that these groups project onto other groups and what they kind of share in common with each other. Um, and we want to think about this, if you see this graphic here that I've given you, changes over time. So you might want to draw this on a piece of paper and then track these changes over time. So I'll have this little logo on each slide where I'm trying to pull this out very concretely to help you understand that inequality is not an accident. It isn't like walking down the street and suddenly you know, a bird poops on you and that's injustice, okay, that's inequality. Uh, and the reason we know this from studying history and structures is that at certain times and at certain places, inequality happens. But in other places and other times, inequality doesn't happen to that same group. And so you can see this is a construction of social groups. People are actually making these choices uh, to discriminate. They're making choices to exclude. They're making choices to uh, favor the, their own group. And so you want to kind of think about that as we go forward. And then I wanted to start off with a quote from a student uh, to one of the survey questions because I think this would be as close to what folks where I'm from would say, um, who look like me. And so, you know, it, it's kind of the American ideology or the myth, right? Uh, if, you, if you've ever taken like Roman or Greek mythology classes, this is the story that is projected uh, in the media, in uh, TV, in film, in music, right? In culture, uh, and oftentimes in education itself that the goal is to be middle class, uh, to not be rich or too rich, right, um, and not to be poor, and really to be in a stable environment, which usually means something like, you know, have a house, own a house, have your family near you, have a job that has good uh, benefits like health care, retirement, and then have some time to be able to take a vacation or relax uh, and improve yourself, right? Um, and I think that What's interesting is that the person at the end refers to this phrase that has become more popular in uh, the last few decades, um, but historically has not been a, a way that people have referred to themselves. So they call themselves Caucasian. Um, and the reason I say this is that uh, I have you know pale skin or pink skin, um, but I'm not Caucasian. I don't have any ancestors that come from the Caucasus in Central, uh, Central Asia. Um, and so it's interesting that like the definitions of quote unquote whiteness change over time. So in the early 1900s, uh, Irish folks weren't considered to be white. Uh, in the 1930s, Jewish folks weren't considered to be white. Um, in the late 1800s, Germans weren't allowed to immigrate to the United States. Um, in the early 1800s, Catholics weren't allowed to immigrate to the United States. So you see these changes over time about who gets to be a part of the identity uh, of America and what that means to be a representative of America uh, changes pretty dramatically. And so you'll think about the last 30, 40 years where white folks or, or you know, Caucasian people are becoming uh, a minority. They're no longer the overwhelming majority of the population, although at the present moment right here in 2020, uh, so-called white people are still the majority population, but the birth rate is lower. So in the next 25 years, uh, very likely, right? There's, it's hard to predict the future, but they are not going to be the majority. So I want you to think about that identity and how Caucasian equals middle class um, and in a stable environment. And, and you'll see that this is a common feature of folks who take their identity for granted. So I wanted to just show you what students have said, what groups they, that they belong to. Um, and you'll kind of see here that there's consistencies, right? People either identify with uh, an action group, a group that's, you know, doing something. They, re they have religious affiliations. Um, they have a group or an identity that refers to preferences that they have, choices that they'd like to make. Um, and then they have very concrete kind of uh, mixtures of these groups, right? So they don't see themselves as one thing, which is what we want to come to at the end uh, about multiple identities. Uh, 
But then you've got groups that, say, you know, people that say none. They have no identity. Um, they don't belong to any groups. Um, and you want to think about who, who gets to make those choices? Who gets to, to say that they don't have an identity? Who gets to get away without having identity? Meaning not so much like what they believe, but what other people believe about them. So are there certain people that you can just look at and you don't need them to tell you what group they're in? And that, that tells you a lot about power and social relations. So I pulled out some quotes that I think kind of show this relationship between identity and groups very well. And so, you know, the first one is very aspirational. It's very ideal. Um, and let's be honest, it's, it's, it's completely unrealistic. I mean, biologically speaking, it's absolutely correct that we are all human beings, right? That is the animal class that we belong to. Um, so then that's kind of a good place to start because it's us, it's human beings that divide us up into groups. You don't see any other species doing this, right? Um, so like cats, for example, are not organizing based on their national origin, right? You don't have the Serbian cats going to war uh, with the American cats. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting kind of dilemma here that, that human beings have created these categories. So this person is, is uncomfortable with either identities that their family has, that they have, uh, or that other people are putting on them. And then other people are very clear about their identity. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's consistent in this class that some folks, some groups are very clear about their identity. And they often talk about how this identity is repeated to them by other people, usually people who are not from their group. Um, and then you have like a kind of interesting one in the middle where the person's from Belarus and they may not have thought about their identity until they met other people from that same group uh, in this kind of American experience of being an immigrant. And so you kind of see that people are, you know, kind of all over. And I, I think the one that makes, you know, the most sense in this kind of in 2020, uh, at least in our, our generation and younger, is this like multi-ethnic group, right? And so that's tough to, to pin down, right, an identity. Um, especially in kind of the older identity politics kind of world um, where you were either like one or other. And then I think, you know, the one that is even more consistent is this like leave me alone group. And that's kind of the a main idea of American liberty. Um, but it's probably not realistic in today's society, right? Like even in isolation and COVID, um, that person who's being left alone is dependent on firefighters, is dependent on police, is dependent on healthcare workers, is dependent on grocery workers, right? So like you can't really like go off into the wilderness and just fend for yourself. You probably never could, but you know, you certainly can't do that now. So to not be in a group is really like, I'll show you a slide later is like Cartman in South Park. You know, he's just like, when he gets upset, he doesn't want to be with his friends anymore. Um, and so that's a very consistent identity in this country uh, that is, you know, from what I hear from folks um, who were born outside of this country, it's not as consistent. I mean, you don't find that uh, as much from what they say in other countries. So it's a really particularly American kind of culture. And I'll, I'll show you some ideas about that. But first, I want to give you a historical perspective. Uh, and so this is from a webinar I was on earlier this week. Um, with Dr. Jelani Cobb, and, and some of you might have been here last year, uh, Dr. Jelani Cobb, Cobb came and spoke to us at Kingsboro. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of this clip. Which, uh, it has worked. Oops. Which, uh, it has worked in the ways in which it has fallen short. And those contradictions, I think, are at the center, one at the center of our history, but also at the center of individual experiences. And so for my father, who migrated uh, north, he left uh, Georgia when he was 17, uh, and came to New York and converted to Catholicism. And you know, really, his experience as an African-American in the Jim Crow South and his experience as a Catholic were these kind of dueling uh, influences, these kind of dueling factors in his outlook on the world. And so 
So he's seen terrible things in the South, and sometimes he would talk about those things, sometimes he would not. Uh, and at the same time, he really embraced the Catholic Church's doctrines of universalism, that, you know, we're all God's children and that you're obliged to pe treat people um, in a particular kind of way. And he tried to reconcile that with his suspicion that, you know, racism had corrupted white people in America that he was really a person who was wary. Uh, and so, you know, he would alternate between saying to me, like, one day, the only thing that you really need to care about is character and how people treat you. That's the only thing that matters. Um, and then two days later, he might say, like, always be wary. Like, you don't know, like, what kind of jeopardy racism will present in your life. You, don't, you never know what people are capable of doing to you. And I don't think he ever in his lifetime kind of found a middle ground between those two. So these duly, these dueling influences, the one that is kind of pushing you towards your individualism, uh, which is largely a myth, right? Uh, and then the one that's more grounded in your family, in your friends, in your social environment, which is concrete, which is real, which is, you know, direct. Um, this is a, a constant in the American story. Um, and you, you, I'll get into a little bit about why that might be. But we do want to call this a contradiction, right? So, and I'll start with the kind of the most obvious one. Uh, you had recently uh, Trump say, you know, once again, that he, he is doing this, right? He, he stopped coronavirus in the United States because he, uh, you know, signed a piece of paper. Um, in his campaign trail, he said he's the only one who can fix America. You know, it's, it's delusional to think like that. Um, and then to pull out the contradiction, you know, like he's been a supporter and friend of the, the Clintons for decades, and then when it suited him, he decided to lie, right, to get certain people to believe him. And it suited his interests. So you kind of have this, like, selfish, rational interest. You know, that's part of the American individualism. And it goes back to this idea that, <clears throat> you know, you can go from, quote, unquote, rags to riches. So, like, you know, if you go opposite, you know, Trump is following in the story of Benjamin Franklin, who wrote a book called Poor Far Farmer's Almanac, who was basically a joke. And Franklin wasn't rich um, and, and successful in the sense that, you know, by the time he got into his 40s, he was, quote unquote, stable enough where he could, you know, do these other things. Now, remember, they don't live that old in that time. So that was the end of his life. You know, he had worked for 40 years. Um, and sure, he started off very poor. Uh, but he, you know, relatively speaking, he, he's not, he was not born into wealth like Donald Trump was. Um, and so this idea that, you know, you can do something alone is a projection. It's an actor. It's this kind of thing that you're putting out into the world. Um, but it's not based in reality, you know, like without Donald Trump's father giving him a million dollars, uh, it, there's no evidence to suggest that Donald Trump has the kind of work ethic um, or even experience to do something like Benjamin Franklin did, but he's holding himself out that way. And a lot of Americans do that. Um, and, and they tend to define success in very short terms, right? So you, there's this idea of everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame, which now is like more like 30 seconds, right? Um, and that's a very fleeting kind of idea of success and it's certainly not a stable environment. And so you kind of see the shifting, um, the individual holding themselves out as being successful versus this older idea of the family being successful. And so then I'd kind of point out, as you see, like, you know, Michael Jordan is, is wildly celebrated. And, you know, growing up uh, during this time, you know, I understand why. But I want to make sure I got a picture in there with Scottie Pippen in the background, because Michael Jordan said over and over and over again in interviews that without Scottie Pippen and the rest of his team, he wouldn't have been able to be successful. And you, you may or may not remember that he ventured into baseball and, and you know, didn't do very well. Um, and this goes to this whole history of social experience. He had a history, starting out, you know, as a young boy, of playing basketball with other people. Um, and there's kind of a legendary story that he tells where he was excluded from playing, uh, and then that just kind of drove his individual motivation. This is the relationship between individualism and a social group. 
um, when you want to join a social group, you kind of discover your individuality, but it's through the social group, right? It's through the team that you discover your individual talents. You don't do it all by yourself, right? It would be funny if Michael Jordan was playing all five um, parts, right? Like in a movie, like if he was playing all five characters. Um, but that's not the reality, right? The reality is that, you know, he was a part of a team, a part of a unit, and that's how he was able to discover his individuality. So I'd compare that to kind of like I said, Eric Cartman in South Park, right? It's only it's only through his friendship with the other kids in South Park that he can make this statement, and it's funny, right? It, it's only funny in that context. If he's standing out in the middle of a field by himself, you know, I did it alone, I can do it, I can fix it alone, and then he says, I'm going home, that's not funny, right? It's only in the context of a social group. And so we even go to this idea of Paul Bunyan and how he single-handedly with his trusted ox, right, um, cleared the entire fields of the Midwest, right? And of course, this is nonsense. But this is the representation of saying like thousands of people from all sorts of different backgrounds, right? All different skin colors, all different languages, all different national origin groups, uh, worked hard to clear the Midwest and make it livable for people. Um, but the person who gets the credit is this one person, Paul Bunyan. And so that's the myth, right? And you can think about reasons why people do this. In religion, they're called idols. Um, but, you know, you can think about why a society or why a social group would, would have one representative um, but it's, you know, it's almost like an inside joke. They all kind of know that it's not really, you know, Paul Bunyan didn't really do this and there wasn't a giant blue ox. So I've made you a, a, a picture here, right? A visual that kind of helps you understand the story of America in a much more kind of deliberate way. So if you think about it from 1550 to 1860, um, there are five contradictions uh, that kind of help you understand why, if you believe that law is simply a command, it is not a command for you. And so I might just pull out this thing that, um, you know, is sociology of religion, um, folks know, uh, and there's a series of people that you could look up on this, but like, thou shall not kill uh, in the Jewish religion, um, was not thou shall not kill. It was, and, and if you ever read the Bible or, or if you're um, from the Jewish tradition, you read uh, those texts, then, then you would know that this meant thou shall not kill someone of your own tribe, right? Thou shall not kill your neighbor. Thou shall not kill your cousin. Thou shall not kill your father. But if you're going to war with another society or you're you know taking over somebody else's land or you're defending your land, then obviously you are going to kill them. Um, and so this is the same principle, right? Like, this did not apply universally to the world, right? The Constitution. It was for very particular people. So if you look in this first blue box, American representatives of the ideal republic are held out to be George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Thomas Franklin, and then later Abraham Lincoln. These are all white men, and they're all white men with English heritage, right? From the from the country called England. They're not European. They're not Caucasian. Uh, you know, they're, they're not German. They're not Italian, right? They're, they're, this is one culture. This is one uh, community. This is one social group's ideal of what they think good government would be. It doesn't mean it can't apply to other people, but that wasn't the intent of the group. Um, so if you then kind of kick over to the other side here, American literature, again, you have Hawthorne, Thoreau, Emerson, and Whitman are kind of like the examples that people hold out in American literature. And again, they're white men, and they're kind of all under this idea of individualism. But of course, they had families. Of course, they lived alone. Like, even, right, folks who, um, you know, have tried to separate themselves from society, you know, kind of failed. And, and if you even kind of look back at some of the colonists, uh, some of the colonies failed. They starved to death. Um, and so I think this idea of American individualism, I don't know what the intent was, right, when, when they were telling the story. But if you're leaving one place, like if you're immigrating from one place to another, um, it, it is an opportunity to redefine yourself, 
in a very narrow sense. And so you could kind of start there and then the story kind of keeps going. But then over time, you'll start to see contradictions. So if you say something like all people are created equal, like Jefferson said, but then you own slaves, then here's the contradiction. It's inhuman treatment of Africans, but it's also degrading to English Anglo-Saxon culture. And so it's like saying like, okay, I'm self-sufficient. I can provide for myself. Well, then why do you have slaves, right? Uh, it seems like the slaves are doing all the work. It doesn't seem like you're doing much at all. So Thomas Jefferson is, you know, was reported uh, to have built his own house, when in reality, that's not what happened. Slaves built his house. But then later on uh, in the 1800s, you have the industrial economic system, which then challenges this notion of small farmers and being self-sufficient again, because you have too much control of the hands of a few. You have a few managers, you have a few, uh, few factory owners, and they have all the money, they have all the wealth, um, they have all the power. But again, it's the majority immigrant population and poor people who are doing all the work. So they hold themselves out as being, I did it all by myself. I made all my money all on my own. But in reality, it was all of those people working. Um, and it was only the shift in really the physical takeover of resources. And, you know, some people would call that theft. Uh, and so you kind of got this idea that this is a contradiction because this isn't self-reliance. You, you don't know how to build any of the things in your fact factory. You know, Donald Trump is a real estate developer, but he doesn't know how to build anything. And so, you know, he talks a lot about being a builder, but he's never built a single thing. So you kind of have this contradiction here again. Um, I think then another obvious one that up until the 1950s, right, you have the unequal treatment of women. So you have John Adams talking about um, equality among the sexes, and then it takes Abigail Adams to remind him, well, don't forget about the women when you go to the Constitutional Convention. And so this is inconsistent with the small farmer life, right? On the farm, women have to work, but in government and politics, they're being excluded. So it's kind of like this, okay, so women are capable of working, doing physical labor, they're capable of educating children, they're capable of educating themselves, but they're not capable of, of participating in politics. This is a contradiction. And then sovereignty is, is probably one of the most blaring contradictions of the Constitution. The idea is that every state is sovereign, that, and sovereign means that you're in charge of yourself. Uh, and this was borrowed from the king. But this isn't really real, right? We're all quasi-subjects. -sub we're, we're subject to uh, global forces like uh, the economy. We're subject to nature, right, like catastrophes and viruses. We're subject to local control. We're subject to our neighbors. We're subject to the federal government and taxes. I mean, we, we don't have a single loyalty, and we're certainly not in charge of our own lives. And so, you know, I think this is one of the biggest contradictions is that the idea is that we're going to be self-governed. Well, that's impossible, right? You can't even control your temperature when you get a, when you get a flu. So this idea, you know, was held out there, but it's an obvious myth. And then finally, there's discretion. So, you know, if the Constitution is supposed to be the supreme law of the land, why do police get to decide? Why do judges get to decide? Uh, why do business owners get to decide? Why do uh, homeowners get to decide? Th this is a, a complication that was, you know, very unclear as early as 1812. Um, and so you kind of see the contradiction here is built right into the Constitution. Now, if we look at the triangles, then, you know, modern policing, as you mostly understand it, uh, comes out of the 1930s. And this was all about union busting. And you can go back and do this research. But during the 30s and the Great Depression, uh, governments, uh, local, state and federal, used the police to break up union protests uh, for fair wages. So, you know, when you think about how the modern policing state works, you'd be better off understanding that it would be used against people who are protesting to get $15 minimum wage, which is probably a lot of you. Um, so that's what police are for. Uh, they have expanded their role, and that goes down at the bottom of this about subjective discretion. In Terry versus Ohio, the Supreme Court gave this power to police to decide when they need to use their policing power. But again, this, wasn't, this didn't exist prior to the 1930s. So if we go down lower, uh, the police history was it comes from continental Europe. It's not even something that begins in England. Um, so in England, uh, you know, the police history was the sheriff 
uh, and that was a political position that was somebody who went around collecting taxes. Um, that was not in any way, you know, you didn't have the kind of policing environment in England that you had in, say, France. And France, when they were talking about police, they were talking about planning. They were, con they were talking about how to organize the city, how to organize Paris in such a way uh, that, you would, that you wouldn't need any kind of um, punishment or any discipline, that people would just be kind of organized in such a way. And so this is called the Code of Conduct in Civil Law. And many of you come from countries that have this background. And so uh, when you say that law is a commandment, it, it does make sense. But again, you have to compare that to the English traditions um, and institutions that the United States have. Um, and remember that those aren't political positions in those other countries. In America and in England, they are political positions, meaning that they're struggles for power and they're given to certain groups. So the history uh, of the common law as it has been applied, you know, was most evident in the South. And if you take Dr. Chapman, you'll learn more about this in policing um, through the slave patrols in the KKK. And so that's the policing history uh, in America uh, and how it's been used. It's been used against unions, against people organizing to get fair wages uh, and fair treatment, and also used against African Americans uh, after the after slavery was declared uh, unconstitutional. So then if we look at these American institutions, they've been built on certain ideologies, and the ideologies are that there's full participation, and not that you will participate and you're lazy if you don't, but that a democracy doesn't work, that we don't really have an American uh, democratic republic unless everyone participates. But again, you know, the contradiction there is that, well, everyone meaning white landowning males. And now it wouldn't be landowning males, right? It would be wealthy males. So, you know, this is a the, the very difficult issue because then, you know, it was based then on economic equality, that everyone would be middle class. Well, certainly some people get to be middle class and get to be stable. But then what do we say about all the people who aren't? Well, that's where the story of individualism comes in. Well, you just have to work harder. You have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and someday you'll be able to be in the middle. Um, but that relies on this myth of self-sufficiency. And so um, what we're really talking about and what, what they meant at the founding was, were these habits, these moral habits, um, and what are called mores. And laws are not mores. Mores are separate, right? This is the whole concept of separation of church and state. Common habits, right, like um, Governor Cuomo gave a good example. You know, if your neighbor's house is burning, you should go over and help, right? Or else your house is going to be burning next. Um, that's how we should be responding to coronavirus. Um, but that's not the story that you hear anymore. You know, it's more about burn, baby, burn. So that moral compass is very different uh, depending on kind of like what group you're in. And so those habits are, you know, very different than those original habits. And so it was Ben Franklin himself who proposed uh, in Philadelphia of having a volunteer fire department. And so uh, you see just a very different society build, built on different traditions. And so if you switch over to um, the common religious experience that those Americans had was what was called Puritans. And, you know, this was not as you know, not as kind of how people think about religion today. It was, they were very clear on the separation, right? A religious organization was separate from the government. Um, and some of these names here were folks that were arguing for social justice, right? That you had a moral obligation to treat everyone equally. And you'll see that this kind of leads to um, abolition or, or getting rid of slavery. And so this is kind of that original kind of goal or the ideal of the United States Constitution and political environment um, and what they thought about law. And law was more of an organizing principle. Um, there are not, there are hardly any criminal laws at this time. And so um, you have to really kind of keep that in consideration as we start to think about the reality of how law actually works today. So first, and you'll see the logo here of changes versus time. So this is where I want you to think about, this is a big time of change, right? So the Declaration of Independence in 1776 is a huge time of change in the United States. The colonists, the settlers, had already been in the country for over 100 years. Now, obviously not these people, right? You know, they didn't live that long. Uh, but their, their grandparents had come to the United States to escape England. 
uh, and mostly because of the political turmoil there. Um, and you know, a lot of them had their grandparents had lost property, they had lost their rights, and so they took the risk to come to the United States in the 1500s through the 1600s to escape that tyranny, to escape that injustice. Um, but the the Southerners, in particular, um, you know, for whatever reason, and and you could do a lot of research on this, but they decided that they wanted to start an aristocracy in the South. Uh, built on land ownership. So they were very much copying what was going on in Europe, um, and there was already a slave trade in existence, and so they decided to participate in that slave trade. And I think this is common knowledge for most of you, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, see this is a huge contradiction. On the one hand, Jefferson is, you know, saying that he uh, is anti-slavery, but he holds on to his slaves, whereas George Washington uh, ended up freeing his slaves. So you see this contradiction even among uh, these English folks. But I want to put this in context, right? At the time, the United States is a very small place. It's not, uh, and it's not even united, right? Um, so at this time, you know, the big power is in Spain, right? And and in some ways, uh, the Holy Roman Empire uh, is is kind of backing this. And so you kind of have this contradiction, right? You have uh, the Catholic Church is participating. Um, in slave trade and in exploration and in, in the killing of, of Indians in, in the Caribbean and in northern uh, South America. And so, you know, you have at this time the bulk of what we call North America is actually occupied by the French. Uh, some of it, like Florida, is, you know, occupied by the Spanish and all the way up through, you know, what is now considered to be Mexico and, and um, California, New Mexico, is operated by Spain. Um, so the English have very little, like you can see it's just a little sliver of pink, uh, on that left-hand side, um, and so th there's not, and they're 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 at war with the French, and so you kind of have this, you know, like myth already uh, that the United States was terribly powerful. They're, they're not, and again, they're participating in the slave trade uh, that you know was largely started by the Dutch, um, and then the English are starting to talk about how they think this should be banned, and in the North, the United States, right, the colonies are thinking about how it should be banned. Um, and largely, it's not because, you know, a lot of the arguments, if you go back and look at them, are not about it being bad for Africans. Um, they're arguing that it's immoral for English folks. It's immoral for white people to be doing this, and that's degrading to themselves. It's making them worse. Um, and so you see this kind of inconsistency and this contradiction uh, in how people are thinking about it. But try to remember that this is how they see themselves in their own culture, and it's largely because they're they're at war with other cultures. So there isn't really this concept of like French, you know, German, Polish people all being white, right? There's this concept of like I'm from France, I'm from I'm a I'm a Catholic, I'm from uh, Czechoslovakia, I'm from England, and that's kind of how they saw their their ethnic identity. If we move forward to the 1860s, then you have uh, Abraham Lincoln. And so this is a huge change again. And this is where, you know, very much like today, you see this tension within, quote unquote, white society. Uh, some folks, and, and Lincoln famously said, you know, um, there's this continuing war between two types of people. One says we should work for our food. And the other one says, you work, I'll, I'll eat it. And so there's this kind of, you know, coming to a boil uh, where you finally see the Civil War. And, and this really happened um, first through rhetoric, through ideology, and through arguments um, with the Lincoln-Douglas debates, where Douglas is defending the institution of slavery uh, and saying that we should be extending it as the country expands west and is, you know, um, as you may or may not know, um, removing... Uh, American Indians from their land and sending them off to reservations or, you know, killing them. Um, and so you kind of have this, again, a contradiction of, you know, there's freedom for me, uh, there's, there's punishment, there's d discipline for you, and you have to obey what I say. Um, and then I just want to bring this back to kind of like family identity, as you'll see on the bottom there is um, one of my ancestors was a general in the Civil War uh, fighting for the North. And so I want to kind of like talk about how that relates, right? So ideology and social relations are a family tradition, right? And, and many people change, right? What, what they don't agree with what their family says. But 
you know, most people, especially in the United States, um, are really just carrying on the ideology of their family. And that family is part of, you know, uh, other groups. And you would, you know, this is a tribal tradition in, if you ever take an anthropology class, um, that is consistent, right, all over the world, that, that families work together with other families, and that's more or less what a tribe is. Um, and they share an experience, they share a narrative, they share uh, religious beliefs or non-religious beliefs, um, and they share morals, habits, etc. So what makes this kind of difficult, you see, is that in periods of migration, and if you look at the bottom, you'll see different groups kind of coming in. So you don't, you don't really have anyone from Ireland, Germany, uh, coming in at, at the quote-unquote beginning. But then you slowly have more Germans coming in. And you can see, like, the, the peak of German immigration um, in the 1880s. And then, um, you know, there's a ban. So you see them start going back down. And then you have new groups that are allowed in. So now, so now there's a preference for Italians, Russians, uh, and people from Hungary or Austria. Uh, and then you kind of, that goes down, right? And that's largely because of the war. Uh, but then you also have, you know, probably one, like the most underrated group, uh, Canadians, right? So Canadians have, you know, peaked. Um, and so have Mexicans. And so, which is kind of common sense, right? Because those are the neighbors. Um, but so you kind of see this like vast migration going from the top of North America to the south of North America. So you have folks, you know, traveling based on economic opportunity uh, from Mexico to Canada and vice versa. And so you kind of just like see like how this fluctuation means that there's new groups coming in with new family traditions, with new ideas. Um, and these are now going to come up in conflict with other traditions. They're going to clash. Um, and so at these kind of times, you, you tend to have folks rise up. And so you had the Great Awakening, um, which was a, a large religious experience. And then later on, you had the anti-slavery meetings. And, uh, you know, they're very similar. And so you can kind of think of like Black Lives Matters now, um, the rent strike that people are talking about, um, the AOC is talking about, um, the Bernie Sanders election, but even the Donald Trump election and his populist supporters, you see kind of this, this awakening, right? This uprising of groups that are saying like, this is my tradition, these are my values, and they're coming into contract, uh, conflict. So the probably the most obvious one that you see in, um, in the reader is the Plessy versus Ferguson case. And so I wanted to kind of like see, you know, not only does the definition of what it means to be black changes, it also, the definition of what it means to be white changes at this time. And so what is probably like the most confusing thing for most folks is that when they read um, the story, right, uh, Plessy is quote unquote part black um, or part African. And yet he's being told he is African. And so this is this, this odd kind of contradiction um, where, where alleged white folks, right, who, you know, of course, nobody can even trace their history at this time accurately. There's no Ancestry.com. Um, and the more you kind of learn about biology, you'll see that this is all kind of um, not based in science, but it's based in myth. And so this myth or the story, this narrative that, that white folks are telling um, is largely a product of the Civil War. So you see this, like, narrative starting to come up as people are pushing to end slavery. And so this is what Michelle Alexander means by the new Jim Crow. Uh, when white folks are unable, when, when Southern white folks in particular are unable to dominate immigrant groups and Africans, they then switch the narrative. So it's no longer physical control. It's no longer power one. It's now power two. It's trying to use the institutions uh, of law, the institutions of education, the institutions of journalism, right, to try to convince people that they should submit and that they should obey. Um, and some people resist in power, too. And this is where you kind of see this tension again. And then you see these new classifications of uh, Indian, um, which at this time, of course, right, tribes are broken up into individual groups. And so they're not a, a, a super group. There's no Indian group, right? Um, and I think this is where, you know, like, for instance, where we go to school at, at Kingsborough was the Lenape tribe. 
And then further south was the Delaware tribe. And so you kind of see, like, they're not a part of the same group. You know, so you have this, like, kind of super groups are being formed um, as a form of convenience of separating people. Uh, and, and this is the power, too, and the resistance to it. So this is a persistent ideology within institutions of both law and education. And so you'll see changes over time, you know, as education becomes widely available in the 1900s, um, and originally the idea was to educate everybody so that they could be productive workers in a factory. Um, so this is, you know, very much, again, power too, that the idea was like, well, if I can't get you to obey me um, through physical force, then I'm going to educate you to be obey to be to be somebody who obeys, who does what they're told, and this is so that you do what you are told when you go work in the factory, that you do what you're told when you go vote, uh, you vote for who I tell you to vote for, um, and and largely in exchange you'll get that quote unquote middle class stable life. Um, but this is like then coming up into the 1950s, you see this kind of hit. Uh, uh, a boiling point again where you where you see that well that's not what ac is actually happening people are doing what they're told and yet they're still getting excluded they're still getting um sent to different schools they're still stuck in poverty and so the kind of the payoff never came so people are complying through power too but then they start saying well there's no point in me complying if it's going to harm my children if it's going to harm my grandchildren and so they start resisting and this leads to uh famously the civil rights movement and so you kind of see change happens here when people realize that power one is not in their best interests and that they're being tricked uh, through what's called hegemony um, or through messaging, through education, through journalism, through media. They're being kind of told that they should comply through this narrative of, well, if you just do what you're told, then there won't be any consequences um, and you'll benefit. You'll get a middle class life. But then that isn't happening. And so they're starting to organize and, and think about ways of changing the system. So I kind of wonder when this is going to happen again, because, you know, um, folks, white kids are being physically separated uh, and going to different schools than people of color. Uh, and, you know, you have this division once again. So it's like the Lincoln Douglas debates all over again. You have some people are saying, you know what, segregated schools are fine. Uh, it's good for white kids to go to school with white kids. Uh, it's good for rich kids to go to school with rich kids. It's good for poor kids to go to school with poor kids. It's good for, you know, uh, African-Americans to go with African-Americans. Good for Latinos. Let's just separate everybody. Um, but then on the other hand, when it comes to when you ask it in a moral way, when you say, is this a moral thing? Is this a custom? Is this a habit we should have? Uh, the majority of Americans say, no, this is bad. Um, so this contradiction once again. So in other words, um, what happens a lot of time, especially when you poll, when you survey white folks, uh, is they say, I think schools should be integrated, but I want my kid to go to an all white school. And this is that contradiction once again. So it's a persistent ideology in America. And then I think what's shocking to most students um, is that New York is the most segregated school district in the United States and in history. In other words, uh, the 13 locations in Brown versus Board of Education were not as segregated as the, as the New York system. And I think what's confusing for a lot of students from conversations I've had is students say, yeah, but it's really diverse. Well, it's diverse in the sense that there are um, a lot of people from lots of different places. But when when you get to when you look at census data, or you look at loan applications, um, or you look at healthcare birth certificate reports, um, who gets to be white? You go back to that slide. Who gets to be white is a, a very complicated thing. And so, you know, I, I think one thing that is kind of just thinking about this is like. You will have an, we will have an integrated school when there are rich white kids, uh, rich pale kids from Connecticut uh, in the same school uh, as poor kids, as immigrants, right, as African Americans. When you have everybody in the same room, that is what diversity looks like. Um, diversity is not like everybody else and then the rich white kids get to go to some other school. That's segregation. So then we want to think about in this class is how can law be used as a tool 
And this is really hard for a lot of you because you're still seeing law as a command, right? But law is not a command because law is not a thing, right? I can't go to Amazon.com and order law. Law is an idea. Law is an arrangement, right? Law is, in this way, we want to think about it as a tool, right? It, it's something that I can invent and has been invented to resolve conflicts, to organize behavior, uh, to think about things in a certain process, which I'll go over uh, in a different presentation. So you want to think about it as an instrument or a tool for social change. And so one ancient Greek word is called the nomos. And so I, I like to think about it as a place, right? Law is a place. Um, and in the courts class, that's what we're thinking about. It's a place, right? You go to court. Well, what do you do with the law there? Well, one side uses the law for their benefit. The other side uses the law for their own benefit. And then they come to a, a, a negotiation, right? They, they organize around the law to figure out how they can solve that problem, either through a mediator, an arbitrator, a judge, a jury. Um, and so you want to think about it that way. Uh, and notice in that example, there are no police in the example I'm giving. Because, um, again, I'm going from that English tradition of the common law, not the French tradition. And so um, you want to kind of remember that the heritage of the United States, although a contradiction, is still based in that English tradition of conflict resolution in the law, right, in the court. And so you want to think about why identity matters so much then, because each group is using the law in their own way. And so if you're not in a group... Um, you're very likely going to be targeted and a victim, regardless of if you think, like, for example, some people think, you know, if they're Caucasian and they have white privilege, that it's never going to affect them. Well, that's not true, right? Uh, there's economic inequality as well, not just racial inequality and ethnic inequality. Um, there's also gender inequality. So a lot of young white women are, you know, unaware that they're going to experience sexism in their life. Um, and you know, this is this is this kind of difficulty of like, well, if you're not in a group, then you don't have any allies. And so that's kind of you're, like you're vulnerable if you're alone. And so believing in this myth of individualism can actually be quite harmful. So I want to end um, with a few clips from from Dr. Jelani Club, who just kind of goes a little bit further uh, and makes these links a little bit clearer. It's laid bare many of the systemic inequities we have in our society. As a historian, what connections do you make between this moment and other pivotal moments in history to help us as we navigate our current state? It's kind of a, a situation where you go, what connections can you make in this moment? And so you know, the first thing I'll say is that it is like in moments of crisis when you come, both in terms of individual character and in the terms of the character of societies, that we actually get to understand who we are. And so what we've seen is that people who are essential workers have been risking their lives. Uh, and our definition of what an essential worker was would have been one thing in January or February of this year, and something very different in March and April of this year. And what we found was that your neighborhood grocer, food delivery person, the factory worker, the person who drives the local bus, the person who is certainly on the front lines of the healthcare um, community, the EMT person, but these are people who are absolutely integral to your life and to our ability to continue. Uh, warehouse workers, male postal people, like absolutely integral to our lives in ways that we had taken for granted. Now, the problem that comes with that is that when we start ticking off those boxes, many of these people are underpaid, have a, a great deal of um, insecurity as it relates to their work and their workplace and their labor. Uh, and you know, many of the people who we're talking about labor who we rely upon are people who are undocumented. And so what we're seeing is the inability to escape the fact that these people are absolutely integral to what we do and, and how we're able to survive in this society. And historically, you know, it reminds me of 
really, really the earlier really points in American history, in history where we really where did we have did a have sense a of sense labor of being labor really being crucial and important. And, important. Uh, and one of the uh, things that happened with the labor movement, labor I think, movement, when you know, for, for people who, people who uh, are uh, thinking about this in terms of literature, in terms of books, it's like Howard like Zinn's Howard People's Zinn's History of the United States, United States, which is, States, which is you know, wildly you know, popular, wildly even popular to this day. It was first published in 1980. 1980. Um, and other, um, you know, other textbooks other like Who Built America, Built America that were reflective of, of this epic that said common, this said common everyday, people everyday people were really the were engines, engines of history. Engines of history. That the things that we have, the things that we've achieved, the eight-hour workday, the advances of civil rights, uh, the, uh, the uh, ability uh, of ability women to women procure the franchise. the franchise. All these things were, these done, things were by done by everyday, by everyday people. people. And the work that actually, the work that actually would, that the society rests society upon, the labor that the society rests upon as a cornerstone, is done by people who could be thought of as heroic. I think we were at that point really depicting people in these heroic terms. And so what happened? What happened? After World War After II, World War really the kind of post-Civil War, post-Civil post -Civil rights, rights movement, movement, era, era, movement era, we saw the declining saw the influence, influence of labor. Of labor. We, in, in the middle of the 20th, 20th century, century, somewhere around 40% of the people were, uh, were uh, labor uh, workers labor were part of labor, labor unions. Labor now it's about 6% of people. people. Uh, and uh, with that, there's been a concomitant drop in our idea of the importance of labor, the importance of workers. And hopefully, and hopefully what this has what done has, done, has, has stripped, stripped away, away what was that it has stripped, stripped away the, the more threadbare uh, uh, falsehoods, falsehoods about, about what, what, what work is important, is important who, we who we really have to really rely have upon to rely in upon society, in society and, and, and what is what owed is to people who are, who are uh, who are really, who are really making sure that our lives can continue in some really fundamental ways. Fundamental ways. The, the, the kind of terrible, terrible cyclical, cyclical parts of, parts of um, um, this story, story is that, is that you know, the you right, know, the to, right vote to vote is particularly for vulnerable, vulnerable populations like African Americans, Americans you know, has never been secure. been secure. I interviewed I Stacey Abrams, Abrams uh, about, a about a year ago, year ago now, now. And, and I said, you I know, said, heard the work that she's been doing around you know, voter access and voter suppression in Georgia. I said, how did we get here? And she said, we've never not been here. And so when we think of the suppression of people's right to vote, you know, you, it's, it's easy to think of, think you know, of Selma, Selma, you know, Ava DuVernay's film, 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 or, or uh, you know, Martin Luther King's, King's speech, speech. And, um, and, uh, and Montgomery to, at the end of the Montgomery, Montgomery, Montgomery to Selma March, March. Uh, or, uh, you know, the Edmund Pettus Bridge and John Lewis, those kinds of hallmark things that we associate with that cause, but we don't really think of Native Americans in North Dakota and the difficulty that they're having you know, accessing the franchise. Uh, we don't really think of people who are in northern states. We think of this as a southern phenomenon. We don't think of this issue as coming up in places like Ohio or Wisconsin, um, particularly what we just saw on April 7th with the, um, the primary election being held in the midst of a pandemic. And so what we have seen is really a revisiting of those same sorts of themes. Uh, in, uh, in, in terms, terms of who has, who has access, access to the ballot, ballot. in terms in of terms voter ID voter laws, laws and, you know, purges, uh, uh, you know, kind of purging uh, voter rolls, uh, uh, things uh, which in, in theory uh, are, are kind of notable or rather noble causes, causes uh, uh, but in practice, in practice have actually put a thumb on the scale in terms of who is actually able to access the ballot. And so there's a concern now that in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, it will, it will skew the ability of people, ability to, come people to come out and vote, and vote. Um, particularly uh, in terms of whether or not they have, access, they have access to mail-in ballots, ballots, you know, what the prerequisites, prerequisites for mail-in ballots, ballots will be, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, in the communities that are being hardest hard hit, hit, as we've seen, uh, uh, are very uh, often communities of color, low-income communities, working people, who will be disproportionately likely to have aversions have to going out to a, a polling place in person. person. And so all and those things, things are really, really you know, at the yeah, front of my mind in terms of thinking about what, you know, what the political consequences of the COVID-19 crisis will be. Absolutely.
show up as upstanders with some of the difficult um, things that you've just um, described to us? So I think there's an exercise, um, and it's an exercise that I do personally, which is that I'm always asking myself, who has the least power in this equation? And that, for me, personally, helps me understand whose interests I have to look out for. So if anything that's happening, I look around and see who has the least ability to protect themselves. I think that it would be great to use the world as a classroom right now for students to write about their own individual communities, their individual experiences. And you know, the nature of this crisis is different from other crises that we've seen. With uh, you know 9-11, which people can make comparisons to, it was very obviously a spectacle. You could go to lower Manhattan, you could go to the Pentagon, or you could go to Pennsylvania, you could see what happened there and why people were reacting to it, why people were traumatized in particular ways. The nature of this crisis is very different, which is that if it happens to a thousand people, there are a thousand different versions of it. Everyone is experiencing this internally in their homes, uh, in their communities, or, or people who are individually having to go out into the world, uh, you know, whether it be on public transportation or uh, on foot or wherever it is, that they, what your relationship is to this pandemic is very, very uh, particularly tailored to who you are as an individual. I would encourage students to write about that. How are your parents, how are your family members uh, experiencing this? And also, what does this tell you about what needs to happen? And so there are other instances that we think about, and certainly in terms of giving context, very important things that have come out of crisis. We talk about the ex easy examples of the deal coming out of the Depression. Um, or even our national grid of highways which came out of the Cold War uh, when the Eisenhower administration recognized that if there was ever a nuclear conflict, no one, the small roads that we had would not be sufficient to evacuate the cities. And they built this nationwide lattice of interstate highways. And that came out of a different kind of crisis. Like, you know, the 14th Amendment, uh, which is the kind of cornerstone of all of our struggles to enfranchise people equally, came out of the, uh, uh, the death and destruction of the Civil War. What kind of things should come out of this? We could look at those other examples and, and kind of study them and people who were involved in those things uh, and what they took from their experiences. And what do these these days that we're, we're you know, experiencing right now say to you about your community or your family uh, or your friends? What do we need? What, what should we be? What direction should we be going in as a result of that? So I'm going to come back to some of these issues in a, a future presentation, but I want to just bring them up now. So what does it mean that some folks can take their identity for granted? They don't have to think their identity um, through and, and don't have to really apply it in their life. And then what does that mean then for most folks who can never take their identity for granted? They're, they're constantly reminded of what their identity is as it relates to law and power. And then I want to just remind you, power one is domination is always going to be used against targeted groups. And so some will comply. And in fact, most people comply. So it, it's not shocking to me that many of you see law as compliance, as obeying. Um, but again, this is problematic because, you know, as, as Dr. Cobb says, like, what about the least of those, right? What about the folks who are unable to defend themselves? Um, that means they're complying with something that is very likely to be harmful. So if they, you know, if it's impossible for them to vote, there's a law saying they can't vote, uh, and they just comply with it. Well, that means their interests are never represented, um, and so then that's not democracy. And so we, you know, at least should say we don't live in a democracy then, um, and we don't want to, and and might as well not even vote at all or even participate, and I'll just let whatever happens happens to me. That doesn't sound like something most people would want to do. Then there's power two as an awareness of domination, and some will resist at this point, right? When people start to realize that this is not in their interest, um, and that the law was never intended for them, uh, and that the law is being used against them as a tool, um, they start to understand this and resist. But I also want to point out that in power two, the empire also strikes back, and so they sometimes they'll abandon um, 
domination through physical force or through um, even the media, right? Like even stories. And then they'll, they'll start to think about it in other ways. And you're seeing this right now. So when it comes to housing, um, jobs, education, and immigration, um, these are politics. There's a struggle for power. It's a struggle for influence. It's a struggle for uh, self-identity. And so you want to think about it just that way. 